I am so happy to be here tonight, to this evening, and to welcome you to present our book, Experiencing the Goddess on the Trail of the Yogini. And uh, I wanted, my name is Stella Dupuis, and uh, I am one of the contributors of uh, this book. And I wanted to tell you just how it starts. I used to go to international book fairs where Mr. Vikas, Vikas, Arias, <laughs> they told me that I pronounced wrong his name. <laughs> so Mr. Vikas, Arias, was having stands that uh, he goes to the international book fairs like uh, Frankfurt and others where and I used to go because I like so much all the books on Indiology and she, he is really uh, one of the best uh, publisher of these kind of books. So we used to talk a little bit. He was astonished that I was buying so many books about the goddess and so on. And uh, so he started to ask me why and I started to tell him that uh, I, I love everything that has to do with Indian mythology and uh, Indian sculpture. So we continued to talk and I told him that I was working with uh, a pandit, uh, helping him to translate an ancient manuscript regarding uh, dealing with the yogini knowledge and uh, so that I was going to special places just to communicate to feel these verses in, in the spaces, in the sacred spaces. So we start to talk about that, and he proposed that I will write a book about the goddess. And uh, <laughs> that is something so important that I thought that the goddess should be approached in different ways, because the goddess is so much knowledge, so much power, that uh, I immediately ask my friends and uh, all of us we come from different backgrounds and we usually have uh, meet during many many years to share pictures, to share articles, books and so on and we have even traveled together to many of these sites and then we we decided to do the book together and to present the goddess through different aspects. And this uh, variety is what we find very often in the yogini temple. I don't know if you have, all of you know about the yoginis and the yogini temples. They are wonderful because when you go inside, there are so many different goddesses and yet the energy of the goddess is there. So it's the one in the multiply forms. The power is very strong. And I feel that a temple is a little bit like our own body, where full of energies are there. And we see in the temples different sorts of uh, goddesses. All are different, but they are like uh, three different types. One is this scary, with fangs out, scary goddesses that uh, they look like that they want to, to kill some demons or have just killed some <laughs> demons. And these demons, for me, are not outside. They are inside us. They are demons like fear, a little bit what I have just now, <laughs> uh, or or uh, sometimes anger, sometimes uh, uh, envy or laziness. All these emotions, they are demons for me. And these goddesses that we have inside us, these energies, are ready to kill these emotions that need to, to, to be handled. And there are other goddesses in the temple, other group. Everyone is there, but there are some types that there are these shanty looking, uh, giving blessings, that we have also those energies inside us 
that help us to go inside meditation and that we are there full of love and so on. And there are a third kind that there are those who have animal head. And those maybe <laughs> are talking about this uh, necessity that we have sometimes of removing our thinking mind and just let the intuition be there and to have this intuition that, that animals have in order to survive or maybe to become like my ancestors <coughs> from South America, the chamans, that transformed themselves in certain <coughs> animals. Maybe it was also that that was there. So anyway, in the temples that they are open to the sky in, uh, in some geometrical forms, you see this variety of goddesses, but at the same time it's a unity that is given sometimes by their same style. So you feel that is one unity in the multiple ways. And what we have in this book is a little bit that. We have different ways of approaching the knowledge or the experience, mostly, of the goddess. And we call it on the trail of the yoginis because it is so different one to another that there are stories. And we love, you know that we love stories. And these are stories tell in different ways because each one of us come from different backgrounds. You have the, the scholars that know so much about all the ancient scripts and about uh, uh, sculpture, iconography. We have the, the researcher that has uh, Janet that has gone through so many years of studying, looking, observing how the god of birth, the goddess of birth are there and the importance rituals that they are for giving birth. And we have Sima that expressed in her paintings is just the mandala. She expressed all the magnificence of the goddess in those images. And you have me that I am the traveler, the one that goes <laughs> in a journey, but mostly it's a journey inwards. So that is what I speak about in this book. Now I'm going to present Nili Machigo Pekar and she <laughs> and she is going to be the moderator for this uh, evening. She will present everyone and be the one that is going to be the maître de ceremony. And uh, she, I will present her to you. She is uh, associated professor at uh, Jesus and Mary College at Delhi University. She has written seven books, I think, and all about, many about uh, Shiva or his entourage. And it was interesting because she told me that the first book she published, that it was his doctoral thesis, that uh, the publisher asked her, what are you going to study next? She wrote about, about Shiva. And then she said, the yoginis. And she has fulfilled, she has honored the yoginis. In all her books, she has a part that she talks about the yoginis in different forms, different views. And in this book, she is giving a wonderful connection that very few people have seen about one ancient established text the, that is in the Brahma, Brahma, Brahmana Purana, Brahman Puran, that uh, is the Lalita Thousand Sarata Nama, Thousand Names, and she she compares these different traditions because you know that mostly the yoginis have been associated with Tantra, but she combines these two different views in a wonderful way. Also, uh, Nilima has been fellow uh, in different universities in Europe and in America, and she gives a lot of lectures in different universities, and recently I was in one lecture in Harvard. She rocked the place. <laughs> Every student was fascinated 
with her and her knowledge, and they want her to come back. So here, I give you Nilina. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's absolutely delightful to see all of you here this evening. And to this much-awaited event, we've all looked forward to it so much. I just want to say just one or two words, I mean, just a few sentences about the book. Stella's already told you about the book, and I'm sure you all will at some point read it, or at least parts of the book. What is fascinating to me is that each and every one of these five women sitting here, all of us, have written our own books. We've individually published many books, different people, different types of books. But this book, the most beautiful thing is that five women all have come together in harmony and have written a book which has gone over maybe four or five years, over discussions, over bottles of wine, over a lot of dinner meals, and it just came, it evolved. It just you know, grew organically. It's not like we said, okay, let's just do this book. It was just because we got along well together, we had this excitement when we were together. And believe me, we did not even agree with each other. So, you know, we are yoginis, we like to call ourselves the yogini gang. You know on WhatsApp you have to call yourself something or the other. So we called ourselves very playfully the yogini gang and the yogini gang stays. And we feel happy when people call us the yoginis. So we don't agree with each other. We don't often agree. And yet there is such a lot of synchronicity between us. There's such a lot of bonhomie between us. And that is something that is marvelous. Because when you work alone, like we all do, Scholars lead a very lonely life. They sit in libraries for hours by themselves, hardly interacting with many people. And then there are the five of us, traveling together, talking to each other, WhatsApping each other, disagreeing. It's just been a marvelous journey. So this book, it's with great happiness we present to you this evening. The book on the yoginis, the Johnson yoginis. And I would like to now, first of all, call our wonderful publisher, who I sometimes call him our hapless publisher. There have been times when we have attacked him in the same manner that yogis are supposed to attack other men. He's the sole man you can see here. It's like a token male over here. He's almost looking a little, should I say, a little scared. And, well, you know, we have all knocked on his doors and we've gone and attacked him and said, why is the book not coming out on time? We're waiting. We've done this, and there are photographic evidence of him looking really scared, and all of us are like, because, because, hurry up. Wonderful man, with so much of patience and so much of grace, he's dealt with the five of us, and he's brought out a book. his book. Uh, he is the founder of a wonderful publishing house, Aryan International Books, which started in 1992. It is amazing the kind of titles and the kind of authors that he has published. People like Devangana Desai, People like uh, Dilip Chakrabarti or Harsha Vihechia, wonderful authors have been published by him. And we are indeed in very good company when he has published us. Thank you very much, Vikas. Um, so, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So next is Javi Chawla, a very dear friend of mine for the last three decades at least. She is uh, she's a researcher, she's an activist, and she is someone who has done a very unique work, worked with the Dais, the traditional birth givers. And how does her book, her chapter, come in with the rest of the Yoginis is because when she was working with Dais in different parts of this country, absolutely grassroots level, going into the villages, interviewing them, talking to them, she saw a connection in the way they are ambivalent. They give you life and they can take away life. And there is something like that you find in the yoginis as well. Why just the yoginis, all the goddess traditions, they, they are capable, they have the power to give life, they have the power to take it away. When you read her essay, you'll find how marvelously unique it is in just the kind of research and the kind of field work that she has done. So we are very happy to have presented you, Janet. And just before I finish with that, just one last sentence. She believes so much in the traditional midwifery, you know, the dais and the kind of knowledge and tradition that they impart. She's one who thinks that they should not be dismissed as just being superstitious or being full of superstition. Does not believe in throwing the ba baby out with the bathwater, <laughs> pun intended. She does think that we need to learn a lot from the dais and traditional medicine keepers. stage, the beautiful Noor, 
who is not only Janet's uh, daughter-in-law, but also is a wonderful blogger. She's a lawyer by profession, and we are so happy to have her here uh, doing this with us and honoring us. Thank you very much. I'd like now to present Professor Namika Roy. She is a professor at Illawak University of Ancient Indian History, which is what I also teach. And um, actually, we met when we went to Illawak for the, we've had a wonderful launch in Illawak, which she got arranged by, you know, it was launched by the Vice Chancellor, and it was covered by all the newspapers. It was absolutely wonderful. It's so nice to welcome her in our midst. She, we have not been able to meet her as often, but we've been in touch on email and on telephone. She is a fellow at the London Asiatic Society, and uh, she is a Royal Asiatic Society, and uh, she has written four books, many, many articles, and when you read her essay, you'll find that she has done so much of work on these particular yoganis from Shadol in Madhya Pradesh. And she has said very, very much, in, you know, in a way that no one else has, that there seems to have been two yogini temples in Shadol, not one. So she has looked at the sculptures in great detail and been able to show us the difference between the two. So I'd like to welcome Professor Amanda Stella Dupuy, she's already talked about herself a little bit, but I'd like to tell you one thing. She was, I, I, I was really surprised when she said, I travel, and she said, I travel, it's within. No, 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 don't believe her. She is a relentless traveler. She is traveling all the time. She is one of those unique individuals who goes to one shrine somewhere remote in Odessa or Bengal, where she has to go into rickety boats and you know cockroaches everywhere and horrible things everywhere. She won't go once. She would have experienced deeply once, but she has to go back twice, thrice, four times, five times. Nobody can keep up with her. But what I like the most about her is whatever she experiences, she doesn't keep it to herself. She goes online and she makes all these films which she shares with the world. Whatever experience she's gone through, whatever she's seen of the rituals, whatever, and she she make these films, short films, and you'll see her all over the online, everywhere. And I think that's wonderful, the fact that she likes to share. And it's, this book came out of her hard work. She brought us together, all of us were busy with something or the other, and she said, let's just do it. And so Stella is the, she's, she's like the driving force between all of us. And I would like to welcome and felicitate her today. Stella Dupuy. And now we come to Seema Kohli, artist par excellence, the most wonderful artist I have ever come across, who works in all the mediums that are there. She is not only a painter, she's an installation artist. She, is, she goes delves deep into theater. She's a poet, she's a writer. Of course, she makes the most beautiful paintings. And she has had 30 solo shows all over the world and is recognized as one of the best paint artists today in India, in modern India. And what she does do, she says it's all, in, it's all dreamlike. Surely it's dreamlike. What she dreams, what she experiences, in her deep meditations, or when she travels, or when she visits any of the shrines, she shows us that she shares that all with us through her paintings, through her art. I think it's absolutely marvelous that an artist would do that. And not only do that, but then write about it so extensively in this book. So we're going to go into the mind, into the mental makeup of Seema Kohli. When you read the essay there, you're going to see what goes on in her mind when she's making those very intricate figures. And like she mentioned the other day, there'll be an old image of Yogani Barahi, but then there'll be coat hangers there at the same time, or there'll be a telephone kept over there at the same time, something modern. So you have to look at them, you know, and each time you look at the painting, you'll see something new. She's a marvelous artist, and we're very happy to have her as part of our book and in our midst today. Thank you. And I believe we are now ready to. Okay. I believe we are ready to release the book.
Seema Koli up. She's going to introduce to us her film. Yeah. She has a short film that she'd like to share with you. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to the evening for this book release. I'm so grateful to you all. And also to IIC for uh, presenting this uh, book release. I'm also really grateful to Kapilaji for being around with us. It is uh, one of the biggest blessings that uh, we could get to the evening. Uh, the video that we are, I'm going to share Tashi, could you just change that? Is actually uh, the travels that we've had together, mostly between me, Stella, and Janet. And uh, Stella has been documenting these without, uh, you know, a very, uh, uh, I can say, in a, uh, you know, preconceived manner. It was uh, just our recordings. Uh, and in fact, they, they're supposed to be uh, shown much later. It is still in the process of editing. But uh, we thought that uh, because this is an uh, even based on uh, the yoginis especially, so we would show it. In fact, the editor is sitting right here between, <laughs> between us and she's going to get really mad that we are showing half edited thing. But I thought it would be uh, nice to share it. Uh, this um, the, the, uh, this uh, experience, because these are from various travels. It is not from one single travel. They, uh, we have taken excerpts from various travels, I think five or six travels that we have had in various Yogini temples together. And she has been documenting that. So uh, is it on? OK. So I would like to share it with you, though it is not a full uh, edit.
to business after that uh, <laughs> rather esoteric film, but anyway, <laughs> now I'd like to invite on the stage Professor Madhukana. <laughs> Professor Madhukana has been associated with many major institutions in the country and overseas. She is the author of several books. And mostly, I would say, she is the foremost scholar of Tantrism. She is uh, someone who wrote, has written a lot on gender. She has spearheaded many national projects. Uh, there's so much one could say about Madhukhanna. We are just so honored and pleased that she has come here and that she will then talk a little bit about the book. I would also like to call upon the stage. Uh, I would like to call upon Vidya Rao. Please come up to the stage. Vidya Rao, as you may, many of you may know, she's a wonderful classical singer who is trained under many well-known gurus, especially Nena Devi, on whom she wrote a wonderful book. She sings songs, Sufi songs, Tumri, Dad, everything. I mean, there's a lot that Vidya does. She's also involved in a publishing house where she's an editor, and all, once again an author of many books and an author of many articles. Uh, we are very pleased that she has a very sensitive, um, a sensitive idea about the kind of writings that we have been doing. We have been involved with her for a very long time as close friends or as acquaintances, and we are so glad that she was ready to come today and speak a little bit about our book. I'll now hand it over to Madhu and Vidya. You can ask... You can ask, uh, we will open it up once they, they say a little bit about the book, and then we'll open up to the audience in case you have any questions. Please, please feel free, and then we're over. That's, that's mother, please. Namaskar. 
Namaskar. Good evening, everybody. Oh, I'm just so thrilled to be here, surrounded by so many Shaktis and such great women who have done what the academia has failed to do. Um, I want to begin by thanking everybody here on the stage for inviting me to this very great occasion and this uh, book release function. And I want to <coughs> congratulate each one of them individually and collectively, the Hevilse, from the, uh, I would say, from the center of my heart, heart lotus, so to speak. Um, and I want to call them the Fab Four, Five. You know, five is a magical number. And it, it's wonderful that the, that the Fab Five have put together this book on another magical number, which is 64. So, wonderful to be here. Now, as I see it, when um, Nilimar spoke to me a few days ago, and she said, look, you must give your responses to the book. Um, but don't let it be too academic, you know, just talk about it really <laughs> So, <laughs> so I uh, looked at the book, I went through it, and I really enjoyed it. I mean, I was, I was quite amazed at the diversity of, of disciplines that have come together in one volume. Now, as I see, the book is a result of the sustained sakihood. It is unfortunate that we've forgotten what sakihood is in modern times. Because all of us are so busy with our little worlds that we, we forget that women-to-women -women contact can transform the world, as I see it. And there are many reasons for it, psychological, <coughs> philosophical, political, but we won't go into, into it right now. So it is, it is a product of the creativity, conversations, visions, dreams, emotional bonding, which comes very naturally to women, and a bonding uh, which they have shared over a period of time. And the book maps the personal and collaborative journey, as each one of them have so well explained, which they undertook th to discover the ancient sites of the yoginis, and indeed, uh, how the yoginis have stirred them, stirred their, their emotions, their ideas, or even changed their philosophy as to how they look upon the world. So as I see it, the book is not simply a catalog of their uh, expressions through scholarship or art, but has turned out to be a spiritual adventure of self-discovery. And that is what is so fascinating about this book. And I have no hesitation in saying that today they have transformed into anshas of the yogini. <laughs> you, know, you know, you have this hierarchy in Sanskrit sources that you have the goddesses who are in one sense abstract because they're concepts and then you have the lesser godlings you know the yakshanis and the dakinis etc who uh, who are the anshas so for instance Rapa had the ashtasakis you know Tipur Sundri has 110 I mean she's not satisfied with just eight so like that you have these groups coming up and so in the process you know, they are all anshas, and they are part of the, the one which Stella spoke about, that you know, you have this one wonderful concept of the goddess who is Brahman, or you can give it in Shiva Shakti, or you know, Parabrahman, and this then, you know, like sparks of a fire, out of that one emerges the manifold manifestations. Um, so in one way, uh, they have realized the great potentiality of the powerful image of the divine feminine in our culture and have successfully internalized the power of these personifications in their lives to lesser or greater degree. But I think once we make an effort, something does get trans transformed. I mean, something does transform. And today they are inviting us to take a U-turn, as I see, into our own spiritual sources through their great works to the image of the Divine Feminine. So my heartfelt congratulations to all of you for opening the door. This is my first comment. Now, of course, as we all know, and Anamika and, and of course our dear 
Nilima would know it better than any one of us, anybody who's gone into you know, study of ancient history and iconography, that these 64 yoginis are one of the most mysterious, enigmatic, and intriguing tantric goddess pantheon. And in order to set this dialogue, why they're intriguing, I just want to go back to some of my historical observations. And one of the best ways, I think, to understand our own culture is when we compare it with other cultures. Somehow, the stark truth comes out. So I go back to uh, a scholar's observation whom I like very much, who worked on the goddess, who's from the West. She's an archaeologist, you know more now. Martha, Marija um, Gimbites, uh, the celebrated archaeologist has drawn our attention to two cultures that have shaped human civilization. The earliest pre-patriarchal Neolithic culture was matrifocal, sedentary, peaceful, and earthbound, and art-loving. That was a woman's culture. And the later culture that followed was patrifocal, warlike, sky-oriented, before a period of clash and confrontation. Now, with the advent of Christianity uh, was a dark moment for the ancient goddess worshipping cultures that spread across continents from India to the Mediterranean. When we look at the Judeo-Christian region, uh, we find that the, these goddesses were labeled as pagan, you know, it was, and they went underground because, again, because of the strong patriarchal uh, sort of monolithic uh, views, um, how the feminine is looked upon. And it's only after 2,000 years that we have feminists like yourself, you know, who are excavating these traditions and rewriting a new history. But what is unique about India is that we've always had a goddess culture from the very beginning. It's a time-free concept. There was never a period in history when the goddess was not there. And we don't just have a goddess culture in India. When you look at Hinduism, Buddhism, when you look at Jainism, or other, you know, I would say cultural streams within these traditions, the sects and subsects and shakas and prachakas, what we have in India is a goddess phenomenon. It's like nowhere in the world because we have a living culture. We have tribal goddesses, village goddesses, goddesses, uh, uh, you know, of course, in the classical tradition, and you know, tantric goddesses, alchemy goddesses, and as late as 1950, we had a modern goddess in Santoshi Ma. And there may be more goddesses who are created. I mean, we find that all the political leaders are being now, uh, you know, eulogized as goddesses. So this goes on. So here is a culture where, where you know, which was in one sense the goddess tradition was recursive, you know. So we cannot write the history of the goddess. Uh, that's my view. It's a very personal view, because no matter what you write, you're going to find something which is going to obliterate what you've written. So, uh, so when we come to the the uh, 64 yoginis, it's a very mysterious, enigmatic, and intriguing uh, pantheon. And this is a pantheon whose genealogy goes back to the Ashtamatrikas. And Ashtamatrikas, we find the earliest symbol of Ashtamatrikas in the seals of Mahindradara and Harappa, where you have seven mothers, you know, and then later on in the Gupta period. And then, of course, there is a plurification of goddesses, you know, when you look at the literary texts. And these Ashtamatrikas are featured in Devi Mahatma and out of there out of the of, out of Durga's body emerged the Matrikas and when the battle with the demons become more and more fierce and the 64 Yogunis uh, emanate uh, from the, from Durga. So this this so it's a very very ancient cult you know. Now uh, the other doctrine which is important when we look at the Yogunis is the doctrine, doctrine of, uh, of power or force. Uh, and many of you must have heard that famous adage, uh, Shiva Shakti Vinashava, that you know. It's one of the key uh, seminal features of Indian goddess tradition, is that by the medieval period, all these lesser gods 
goddesses that we find in the rural culture, who are also mentioned in the Mahabharata and Ramayana, and also other Purans, uh, they get assimilated into an abstract notion of Shakti, which again is taken up by the Tantras and the Agamas in a very big way. And what is this the notion of Shakti? This notion of Shakti is that uh, the, the feminine <coughs> deity is um, is uh, the embodiment of cosmic power. She's active. She is she is divinized as somebody who is who's dynamic and active in and in relation to her male consort, who might be her husband or otherwise. She he who is looked upon as being passive. So this idea of power and force gets linked to the god goddess at a very early period of Indian history. Then the, another feature which I, which I think that we should uh, take into account is that these goddesses, whether they are married or unmarried, but they are all autonomous, sovereign, and independent figures. They may be husbandless, but they, they, all they, many of them draw their powers from their own resources. And the, these 64 yoginis, when you look at the text, the few that, that, that we have found, they are gratified by left hand practices and, and also um, they um, are worshipped in many forms of transgressive rituals for the attainment of Siddhis, power. Again, the power complex becomes very important. And therefore, most of these temples are linked with royal power. You know, and they legitimize royal power because the way they are placed in sites, you know, different sites of India. So, the other important thing which I think uh, Jogani's embody, and this comes out uh, very vividly in the Shakta Tantra and also the Shaiva Agamas, is the theology of male and female equivalence that I just spoke about. But more than that, that how every woman, how does the link of this abstract divinity then gets linked to day-to-day -day life? Every woman, irrespective of her caste, creed, age, whatever she may be, wherever she may be, is an embodiment of the divine feminine. And so one of the interpretations of yoginis is, a yogini simply means a woman who self-realized, you know, from union, yuj, from the Sanskrit root, root yuj. So these are self-realized female ascetics, you know, or women who have mastered, you know, their, uh, uh, their shadripus, their the enemies, the, what she was talking about, you know, that it's an inner journey when you look at a, look at the image of the uh, yogini, that you know all the negative traits of the of our of of our personality uh, has to be uh, transcended if you want to be a perfect yogini. So yoginis are, in one sense, they are human beings who had attained that, you know. Uh, spiritual height to be called yoginis. And when we read some early historical texts, we find we find names of yoginis, that they were real mortal women. For instance, you have the text of uh, Maha Artha Manjari, who was, which was written by Maheshwar and Nath, it's a tantric text. Now there he very openly says that this text was revealed to him by a yogini. And in the tradition which I have researched upon, which is the Sri Vidya tradition from Kashmir, you have the names of Mukta Keshini. She's a yogini. And Mukta Keshini uh, again uh, traces her genealogy uh, from Lopa Mudra. And Lopa Mudra is a mythical figure, but in the midst of Lopa Mudra, she is the one who initiates Agastya. So, how you know the yogini tradition then becomes a tradition where they were great transmitters of knowledge. You know, and they say that, that in order for tantras to be efficacious, the, the revealed uh, truth must be transmitted through the yogini. So that is one thing. So basically a yogini is, if I can recall a uh, passage from Bhagavad Gita, Atmanam, Atmana Pashye, one who beholds the self with the self. Okay, so I think I'm at the end of what I want to say. What uh, my last word is really about um, that, you know, one of the things that has uh, really um, uh, ignited my spirit after reading this book was that uh, what, uh, um, what Stella has written in the book, and I just quote it, 
scholarly readings may provide pieces of the puzzle, but I'm open to other levels of understanding that are beyond myself. So that is what this function today is all about. So we are celebrating the yoganis, by the yoganis, for the yoganis, forever yoganis, you know, in that sense. Uh, so we are celebrating, what are we celebrating? We are celebrating transcendence and imminence of the goddess. Uh, we are ce celebrating her divine play, Leela, um, uh, how she manifests in mortal yoganis. And I personally feel that such works can be read and reread to empower and affirm women's selfhood so that they can become authors and players of their own destiny. That is really the message of the book, which is implicit, you know, which is implicit, but I'm just sort of sharing it with you how I saw it. So basically, well, thank you for inviting me. And I think we should have more such conversations because all of us here do have the feminine in us. And it's only when books like these are compiled and written and talked about that that flame gets triggered off and say, oh, I can relate to this. So, and I really think that uh, Kapila Ji and uh, you know uh, the great stalwarts who are here should have a desk here on on study of the feminine and how it relates, how it should relate to contemporary feminism, because I think that every woman. Goddesses were created for women. They were really not created for men. You know? They were really created. So, and every woman can identify. I'm sure everybody in this hall can identify at least with one personification out of the 64. You know, because there are so many, so different, so diverse. But it's sad that we have not taken these images and these studies seriously in India, how they can connect with women's liberation. So with these few words, I want to thank all of you. And I'm really happy to be here. And I hope that we'll have more such uh, you know, conversations tomorrow. Thank you. Comments, and uh, we all would be thinking about what you said. And I would now like to ask Vidya, would you like to come up here and speak? Or would you like to speak from there? Uh, anything you'd like to say about the, the book? or You can speak from there. Certainly. Thank you so much, all of you, uh, five, five, as you have so rightly called them. Open Panchakanya, Jodi Akena Chamo. I, you know, so much of what I would have wanted to say, Madhu has already said. Um, you know, this is a testament, this book uh, is a testament to the power of. Um, friendship between women, uh, and to the power of friendship, actually, we forget how important it is. And that's so wonderful. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm going to speak only very personally in the way that I have read this book, this wonderful book, and I have loved it and enjoyed it. And I want to thank all of you, because uh, I kind of followed you and your journeys, I've been sort of at the fringes of your conversations, sometimes fringe, sometimes little more central. And um, it's really been wonderful. Um, I think for me, what is the most interesting thing about this book, and I'm speaking really just as a woman, a contemporary woman in, in, a, in a very patriarchal society, which is becoming harder and harder, more and more misogynistic, and more and more uh, you know, the multiplicity and the diversity of the way in which we can think, it's becoming more and more homogenized. And in this context, you know, when a book like this appears, it gives you some, it gives you a first an opening, it gives you possibilities to think differently, and it gives you some hope. Yeah? Now, uh, you know, when, when, uh, when we as women, young women, older women also, we all know, all of us know, we all have been given these role models of what a woman should be like, and they are generally not very comfortable for us. You know, clothes don't fit that well. Here is a wonderful role model. First, indeed, of women who are friends and who are not under the control of men. Totally. They may or may not have men in their lives, 
which is fine. <laughs> Let's not do here with the men all together. But, but this wonderful thing, you know, which uh, yeah, has been romanticized as a cute, romantic ban jata hai you know, it comes as a romantic thing. But it's much more than romantic, it's very, very strong, it's very powerful. And I think every one of us here, uh, and I'm speaking really to the women, every one of us here knows what it is to have a group of women friends and how we support each other and how we uh, survive in this world, how we laugh together. So yes, thank you for reminding us of this. Thank you also for giving us this very different vision of women. And uh, the, one of the things I want to say is, you know, that for me, again, I just as an ordinary woman, who is not a scholar in this field at all, I really don't know what I'm doing here except that I love these women. <laughs> Um, uh, but just as an ordinary woman who is interested in mythology, who is interested in art and things, I look at those images, you know, and they are so incredible. They are so beautiful. They are beautiful uh, in their strength and power. They are beautiful in the, you know, just the position of their body, ki, the, the movement. You can feel the movement of the body. You know, it's, it's so aesthetic and it's so powerful. You know, today, sometimes when we think of beauty, we think of it as a very soft thing. But there is also this huge power here. Yeah? Um, you can see the connections between uh, yogic asanas. You can see uh, the, how that becomes dance movements. Huh? And you can also see how that becomes ways of holding the body just to live. You know, just to live and to breathe, to, to be able to breathe, to get your voice moving, yeah, to live in this world, to feel the wind. Uh, and that was lovely, you know, I have not seen that, uh, uh, that video, but it was so beautiful because, you know, yeah, no, it's lovely, it's totally beautiful. Yeah, uh, and, and you know, what you really see as, as you are moving, Sima, as you are moving through these images which uh, in a sense, we might say are static because they are stone, they are carving, and here you are moving through them, and you know, suddenly for a moment you say, which one is moving and which is still, you know? And are they, are they exchanging the energies here? Yeah? It was so lovely. It was so beautiful. And again, this is something, you know? And I loved also when you talk about, you know, this is something that is so wonderful. There's, I think they're called Thelomorphic, you know? Where they are. Yes? These images, yes, animal, animal, part animal, part human, indeed to remind us that we don't only have to function with our heads. Sometimes it's very necessary, even Kabir says that ke sar chhod ke aajab, you know, just leave your head behind. <laughs> but also, that, uh, also a very important message for today's world that we are part of nature, we are animals. We are animal creatures, you know, and we cannot separate ourselves from the Amazon forest for Kartbo and you know, you can do whatever you like, you can we are we are also animal, we are also nature. Um, I, I think there are about a hundred more things, but I think maybe this is the time to stop and just <laughs> maybe open this up here. Yeah? May I do that? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Vidya. You spoke so much from the heart. It was wonderful to hear you speak. You know, we're all so used to Vidya just taking off and singing so beautifully. And here's one place where we've not asked her to sing. <laughs> we just told her to come and give us her remarks, and that was very nice. And now, in case you are intrigued enough and you have any questions to ask, please, please feel free to ask any of the people sitting here, or, uh, or just even comment on something that you may have heard today. Please, go ahead. The mic, uh, do we have a mic? Does anybody have a question to ask? Yes, Renuka. Can you please introduce yourself? Also? He, she, he's getting the mic. Can you introduce yourself and then? Oh, good evening, I'm Renuka Singh, former professor from JNU, a sociologist. Uh, and I'm heading uh, the Shita Mahayana Meditation Center in Delhi. So first of all, I want to congratulate all of you for putting this book together. I think it's uh, a very wonderful <coughs> moment in the lives of women. Uh, but I was just curious to know, uh, was there any soteriological dimension to your journey? 
when you were traveling around, I would like to ask you, women. Uh, and secondly, did you also come across diversity of ascetic modes of the yoginis by any chance in the various temples? Thank you. Sipa, you want that? Part of it, but whatever. You. Uh, initially, there was. I must say that when I started off, uh, then uh, I was working on the, uh, there was an order in which I wanted to do the Saptamatrikas, the temples where they were, the Saptamatrikas were revered because I was uh, working on that, uh, building up a show based on that, it was called Parikrama. And it was uh, uh, various sites we were, we were in Madhya Pradesh, we were in, uh, I think, mostly Madhya Pradesh, Gwalior, Jabalpur, uh, Khajuraho, all these areas. Where I, and then I think it was also in Chhattisgarh, one or two places. And uh, I did have that, uh, so there was an order to it. And the second question, I am <coughs> sorry, I've forgotten. What's an ascetic practice? Huh? <coughs> ascetic. ascetic. Uh, of course, uh, uh, and each, uh, uh, most of the sites, they had different yoginis. They were not, so for me, it was also about the fact that I don't uh, actually go by the fact that I, I take yoginis as energies. I'm not taking them as academically, they're put uh, in a certain thing that they come from a certain hierarchy. For me, they are not uh, a hierarchy. They are they are energies, energies which are present, omnipresent everywhere, and you can and they they are not sixty four. They are constantly multiplying according to whatever you see, whatever you do, and of course, most of the temples they had different yoginis. There were few, I think. Uh, about 14 to 15 yoginis which were prevalent in most of the yogini sites. But there were different yoginis in different sites and it was really beautiful to see uh, different animals, uh, animal heads and animal forms taking shapes in these feminine bodies. Uh, for me, it was also another thing not to look at them as uh, you know, we are part of that animal stream, but also of the fact that somewhere down the line, we did take the knowledge, the intuitive knowledge of the animals to be much greater than the humans. Uh, there were certain aspects. Uh, we broke the chain, right? So we did overcome a lot. Uh, we, you know, covered the distance in a different way. But uh, at that time, probably, the feminine was also having a heightened uh, intuitive power, which it still has uh, in its uh, physicality. And uh, the animals they could connect to and probably get that for their inner journey, that intuitive power. I look at it like that. It was not that they could cut off the heads or something. That's, it, it's really bizarre some places that, OK, they used to put up the uh, different animals head on themselves or something. So of course they were uh, at different spaces and different sites. They had different uh, more uh, ways of uh, their penance and meditation. And, uh, in fact, in Naresa, where we went and we saw the temple is no more there. It is totally um, uh, in shambles. They're trying to reconstruct it. But uh, you could see how far it is from the village. Most of these temple sites were away from the villages. They were closer to the uh, water tanks, water bodies somewhere. And somewhere, uh, like in Naresar, there were separate, uh, you know, hutments kind of uh, made separately for them, uh, the medicants. And in some places, you could see them as a circular form. They could, they, they, could, they could sit and meditate or probably do their, you know, all their exercises, <laughs> mental or physical. Can I? Sure. sure. Yeah. yeah, you know what has happened about the yogi temples? Of course, there's a huge 
uh, ritual nomenclature which has been there, which is there in the text. You know, how to worship the yoginis and what are the mantras and what are the offerings and how you gratify them, etc. But what has happened is that, you know, these temples are now lying barren, you know, and those traditions have disappeared. They are found only in texts, you know, and it is and the kind of people from the village and all who come and pray, they, they are just making their offerings. I don't think they know the kaula path, you know, but in the text you've got the prayogas are there. The prayogas are very much there in the text. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I have a yes. Uh, anyway, I just want to know if you have a career, and mm -hmm. I am the Mahi director of Gary Nabia. Yes. yes. So, um, my name is Rupert Kalra, and I am the founder director of Gary Nabia, and I work very closely with Sima Kodi. And I'm very pleased to be here. I have this random question which I want to ask you. That was there, when you went to the temple, did you feel some kind of different energy in different places. I'm just asking as, you know, uh, somebody mm -hmm. who brought beans to them and I would, whoever, uh, whichever one of you would like to. Stella, I, I think Stella. And what was the difference in it? And what is some which were like, which were like very easy, I don't know what it is. So that's what, uh, and which uh, one? Jyoti. So, as, um, as uh, Nilima was saying, I love to go to this temple several times and every time is different because I am different every time and uh, the, <laughs> the energy is, is very strong and sometimes it can really take you and you, for me I am a, a meditation and yoga teacher so for me to, to get uh, in a place I, I do meditate and Really, there are places that take you out. And sometimes when we have been also with Sima, we just dance and go around or with Janet. It, it's so many different ways of uh, experience okay. the place. And As which were the ones which sort of really intrigued you or, you know, which stood apart? Would you be able to name any of them? You know, because I would love to go to some of them, may not be able to go to all, so that's why I'm asking. This One question. of them for me is uh, Rani Pujaria, yeah. because it's, it's uh, near the border with Chhattisgarh, and it's a place that is quite far away. I hope that uh, it will be uh, respected a little bit more. Because last time I went uh, in uh, last year, not even some months ago, I went there and on fort I was very happy because the road was beautiful. They have put trees in the road. The road was not terrible as before, but that means that people come there. And when people come there, I'm going to tell you something horrible. They create among these, not in the Yogini temple, but in the site next, they put some, some things there and they did a little shop to buy food. And food, it means that people eat and throw things on the, on the, on the ground. So this bringing the people there is beautiful, but Ah, and the music, my God. They also brought electricity. And then it was this <laughs> very, very loud. That in the temple you couldn't listen so much, but there by the, by the Shiva temple, yeah. it was terrible. It was so sad that sometimes this, uh, I felt even guilty that I wrote uh, my first uh, little book that I wrote about that, it was how to arrive to those places. And then the tourist people <laughs> thought that it was good to attract, and I felt even guilty that that is not taken care of properly. So I hope that the, when you will go, because I claim and I went to all the places to say, you need to put at least beans. If they are going to sell food, they need to have beans to put the, the garbage. 
So I don't know what is going to happen. I hope that that, <laughs> that it will continue to have this spiritual beauty. The temple in itself is amazing. So I, I think I'm sorry yeah. that to tell you the truth is it removes no, a little bit of the magic. But it's something important that we need to know is that we need to take care of these holy places. Yeah. I think Anamika would like to add to that. Yeah, I mean, um, I will just pick up the thread where Stella has left. You are asking about the Yoni temples, which one you would like to visit, where you can get that feeling. No, the energy. The energy, energy. energy. Actually, I visited these temples, especially this Rani Pujaria, which is in Bolangir, as a historian. Not as a worshipper, not some, someone very curious. I had to finish my project. All the images of Rani Purjharia are in the dancing pose of Odisha, mm -hmm. like this. Yeah, they are like this. Well. Yeah, okay. they are. And there's a there was a historian Charles Fabry who in uh, way back in 1974 he had said, "Are these the dancing devdasis, which were carved as yoginis?" As I said earlier, that I went there as a historian, but when I stayed there, it was quite quiet because Bolangir is quite cut off from the main population. Only one train goes over there. And when I went there, there was only one restaurant built by some Marwari. So it was a very deserted place. You sit over there for some time, close your eyes, surrounded by 64 yoginis with awful faces. All the are you in the hands, but in the dancing pose like this. Then you feel this. There is something other than what is written in the textbooks, other than what is there called a jan nirane. What is there? What is this mystic feeling? What is so much mysterious about these yogini images? Only one case is so I am taking that is Rani Ganjharia. I suddenly you feel, yes, to some extent, Charles, was Charles Fabry right? Are these the dancing Devdas? Because this cult of Devdasi, because it is uh, associated with fertility, and there is some connection with the yoginis. Um, um, Professor Mahalakshmi is here in Telangana, this sect of uh, Jogans and all, the outcast. So there, there's a connection. There, there, this is a triangle. The yogini, the carved yoginis, devdasis, and all these jogutis of Maharashtra, Karnataka, and Andhra Pradesh. You just sit over there, and you will feel the energy. You will feel the dancing steps. These yoginis who were deified, but originally they were women of flesh and blood, like uh, Professor Madhu Khanna had said. And uh, even it is said that uh, in uh, Assam, in Kamru, Idam Shastram, that is called Jnana, Idam Shastram Yogina, Grihe Grihe. Each and every woman of Kamru, that of uh, Assam, is a Yogini. So you can feel that energy, you can feel that. But you have to feel it. You have to go beyond. What is it in there? You go to Hirakur. Hirapur is totally different. It is also in Odisha, but it is totally different. <coughs> These are all Puranic deities. You have Ganga, Yamuna, Narmada, Saraswati, all are carved there. You have local deities of uh, Odisha, they are carved there. There you will not find that feeling because they all these yoginis are taken from the Puranic texts and they are local deities. But if you go to Bhiragat, you will get that feeling. Uh, yes. Um, so it depends. Uh, it varies from temple to temple. Do you want to speak? Yeah. Um, I, I think it, 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 anybody else has any more questions. Jan just wants to say a word about what was said earlier. <laughs> just go ahead, please. Anybody else has any questions that we can answer? Them? Okay, you can take. So, can I? May I just speak before? Yes. Yes, please go ahead. Um, when I went to uh, Ranipur Jaria with these guys, um, it was interesting to me, I noticed that one pundit came and he bowed to um, Bhairav or Shiva uh, 
and ignored totally the yoginis. <laughs> and then uh, an older couple was there with, a, with the daughter-in-law and the son and the baby. And they went around and left little flowers, small, small flowers on all the yogini temples and totally ignored <laughs> the Bhaira. And um, I thought, yeah, that says it all. That's, yes. That's the thing. But one thing I want to point out is that I wrote the essay on, um, on the birth goddesses. And you could ask why the birth goddesses got in with the yoginis. Well, one answer is, it, it, um, one answer is that they, as I use the phrase, swing both ways. <laughs> they can both bless you and curse you. But, um, and that's true of the birth goddesses and that's true also of the, um, of the yoginis. But I want to point out that, w which nobody has mentioned here so far, that women are birth givers or they have the potential to be birth givers. And this is a manifestation. I like that word, ma English word, manifestation. I don't know how you say it in Hindi. Mm -hmm. but, um, but women have the power to manifest. They manifest. Men don't have that power. They have a, a, a little far away power <laughs> of insemination, but not of manifestation. And I think that kind of energy we're talking about energy. That kind of energy at birth is incredible. You can you can go to um, you can go to temples and everything, but you can also uh, attend a birth or be at a birth because birth is a manifestation. It's the power of creation. And uh, if there's any answer that I have after living 40 years in this country of why there's Shakti, why there's Devis, why there's everything, it's because of this power of manifestation, which women have. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So, um, <laughs> oh, we are opening up a Pandora's box here, I can clearly see. You can see what happens when we all get together, everybody, <laughs> then sometimes Janet will have to shoo us and say, quiet, can you please let me talk, because everybody wants to talk at the same time. And I know you all must be getting late for all of you, so should we end the session, or is there another question that anybody might want to ask, or a comment? That gentleman there, there was a, uh, yes, yes, yes. That. My question is for Stella Dabui. Yeah. You said that uh, you uh, like everything about Indian mythology. Since you have traveled extensively, I presume that you have a fair knowledge about mythologies prevailing in other countries, the Greek mythology or any other mythology prevailing in any other culture or civilization. My question to you is, how do you feel, what is so special about Indian mythology? And how, how is it distinct from other mythologies prevailing in other parts of the world? It's a, it's a good question and I will try to be brief. <laughs> yes, so, <I> is. <laughs> I, I am more familiar with uh, pre-Colombian uh, mythology. I, w I, was, uh, I was born in Panama and grew up in South America. So all the ancient pre-Colombian mythologies are about the, w the, the, the creator is a woman, is a mother nature with different names. So I was used to that when I came to India, and then is something karmatic maybe? I don't know, I fell in love, and I was very young when I started to travel here, and when I saw this multiplicity of, uh, of expression of uh, mother goddess, I got just uh, fascinated because it's so much in every single sculpture, in every single myth, you have layers and layers and layers. So how not to be bewitched by that? So it's, I am so happy that I could come here and that uh, I, I am an India lover. <laughs> 
So uh, that's very nice. Uh, I think we can say that the session is over, and I want to just now thank all of you to come for your patience and you know celebrating with all of us. And we all feel very close to each and every one over here today because there's a nice energy that's built up with everyone talking and laughing and sharing together. Thank you very much, and have a very nice evening. Thank you.